Okay, we'll make a start. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar with Fortuna Admissions. Um, we'll be talking today about applying in the final rounds to business school. Um, it's not necessarily something we would normally be encouraging you to do, but obviously we're in unprecedented times and there seems to be an opportunity that's opened up for candidates applying in round three and, and for some schools round four. Um, so we'll be talking about um, the issues surrounding uh, applying in this in these um, final rounds and how to tackle your application and think about applying to business school in these challenging times. Um, I'm joined today um, by my colleagues, um, Bill Kuza, who was Associate Dean at Chicago, at Chicago Booth. Um, he was there for about three decades, right, Bill? That's, that's right. And, and pretty years. much did every job at the school in the, in the business school um, during that time. Um, yeah. So, you know, brings a fantastic experience and, and, um, and your sort of historical perspective as well on the ups and downs of, of um, handling crises at, uh, at business schools. Um, and Karen Hamu, who is a Columbia MBA graduate and was also head of MBA recruiting at Deloitte. Um, I was um, head of admissions at INSEAD, um, also an INSEAD grad um, and uh, uh, one of the founders of Fortuna. Um, so today we'll be talking about, as I said, um, round three, round four, um, what are the issues um, specifically for this round? There are always you know, some concerns that you should keep in mind in applying in a fi final round. Um, the, the game has changed somewhat um, given these, um, the, the crisis that the schools are facing and that, um, uh, you know, that the changing context for many of us right now. Um, one of the, the, the concerns that schools have, um, of course, is that they, they can't be sure how many people who they've admitted from round one and round two who will actually um, come to campus. So um, they will have more places available now. And that's also why you know, they're, they're opening up, extending um, deadlines for round three and opening up around four in some cases to, to enable more candidates to apply, um, given that they may otherwise struggle to, to fill the class for this fall. Um, so related to that, the first topic that we wanted to talk about um, what are the changes we're seeing to the admissions process? There have been a flurry of announcements from um, most of the top schools about changes in deadlines, changes in admissions policies. Um, Karen, could you give us some of the highlights of, of the, um, the updates that we've seen in the past week or, so, week or, week or two? Absolutely. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes. Um, and I also recommend that everyone check out the post on the Fortuna blog, which we're updating every day because things are constantly evolving. Um, but what you're going to see there, like Caroline said, so we're seeing round three deadlines pushed back for most schools. Actually, not all schools. For example, Stanford didn't uh, push back unless that happened in the past few hours. Um, we're seeing additional deadlines added. Um, we're seeing deferred enrollment programs pushed back, um, especially because, you know, those students wouldn't be starting in the fall. So the schools are really, they have a lot of wiggle room there. So they're really looking for strong candidates and they want to give them time to apply. Um, we're seeing schools accepting applications without a GMAT or GRE. Um, and we'll talk about kind of what that means. So some schools will actually render decisions without those scores. Some schools will wait for those scores before they render their decision, but there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, and there's also the option to take the test at home, which is really interesting as well. Um, we're seeing interviews going online, admit weekends are changing, going online canceled. Um, also delayed semester start dates are already being published. So Duke, for example, published that they're pushing back their start date a little bit, and we might see that um, with other programs as well. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of uh, a lot of changes happening, um, and uh, um, you know, really, it's a situation that's changing day by day. So I encourage you to um, check out the updates that Karen mentioned, and that we're keeping track of on our website, and of course, you know, keep in touch with the schools um, during during these times. Yeah, I, I think Caroline, that's that's probably one of the key. Um, ideas coming out of this webinar is things are changing so quickly and in so many different ways that it really is important for applicants to stay in touch with the schools, stay in touch with, yeah. with uh, any coaches they're working with, just to stay on top of what, what's happening, because uh, it might have a big impact on how you think about your application. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so next question, um, 
that we wanted to discuss, are schools looking for a particular type of candidate in these later rounds? Um, so, Bill, what are your thoughts on that topic? Well, my, my thoughts, and, and you all might have slightly different views, is in general, schools are going to continue to look for the kinds of candidates they, they've always looked for, people that you know, mm. fit the personality of the school, that have strong academics, that have strong work experience, that are going to contribute to the life and, uh, of the school. Mm. Uh, I think the challenges this year is that in this last round, there's going to be concern about, um, as, as there usually is, students from outside the, outside the country uh, of the school. And it's mm. just hard to get visas. So I think, uh, and that's the reason most schools have international deadlines earlier than the last deadline. Yeah. So in, in terms of uh, other attributes, I don't see significant change. Um, still looking for very good candidates who are gonna fit into the, the overall profile of the school. Um, there may be greater emphasis on, on people who are committed to coming uh, regardless of the, um, mm -hmm what happens over the course of the next several months. Mm. So if there's some way to indicate that the, in the application, I think that's important. Um, mm. But in terms of the un underlying attributes, I don't see significant change. Um, there may be more opportunities uh, for you know slightly lower numbers than there have been in the past, but I, I'm not convinced that that's true either, given how competitive mm. most of these schools have been over the last few years anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, typically it's tighter um, in the final rounds, you know, especially for the top US schools. So, right. you know, 12 months ago, um, you know, the competition would have been different. And, you know, I think the schools would at this stage be looking perhaps to fill certain profiles in diversity in the classroom. Um, and, and uh, you know, but, but, you know, given that their yield is dropping, right. um, there's less pressure on them to just be, you know, selective of those specific profiles and they'll be looking to fill, um, you know, a wider number of seats in the class. Yeah, so so the this round may look more like a round one or round two in years past right. rather yeah. than kind of schools cherry picking for particular kinds of people. I think that that's, as I say, I think the, the general sense will be, we're just looking for the great candidates as we always do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, you still got to have a story application, then, <laughs> even if you're applying in, right. in uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. <laughs> yeah, this is not a time to just kind of throw together something at the last minute and, right. and you know, hope that it's going to work. Uh, it still has to be a good solid application. And, yeah. And you have to provide something to the schools that they're going to want to and value. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the next question that we had, uh, what are the implications for international versus domestic applicants? So, you know, this is a very tricky question um, because right now uh, it, it's not possible to get a, um, a, a study visa to come to the U.S. The embassies are closed, um, you know, also for uh, international schools, you know, they, they have similar issues. Um, so international mobility right now is obviously right. very restricted um, and nobody knows when that situation is going to change. So, um, I mean, what we hear is that some schools are waitlisting more um, for in international candidates. Um, they would certainly like to admit more international candidates and be able to bring them to school. And, um, you know, I think the yield on international applicants or the international admits that they've admitted from earlier rounds from round one and round two will probably be quite low because people will be concerned that they won't be able to get to campus, that maybe they'll be starting with online classes and that's not what they want to do. Um, so I think that there's certainly an opportunity for international candidates to get in, um, to get admitted in these final rounds. Um, but you know, you may be facing starting the program online um, if you're not able to get to campus. Right. Um, I understand that for Canadian applicants, um, it, it may be a bit easier for them to get to the US more quickly. Um, if you're coming to the US for, for, for your uh, MBA, um, and of course, you know, if you're an international applicant already in the country, so, you know, if you're working in the US, you're a green card holder, um, and you're applying to, to business school, then I think you know, you've got a very good chance of getting in right now because the schools are very concerned about um, you know, the bleed of international candidates and, and low yield and low um, percentage of international students in their class um, in the fall. 
so, you know, if you already are here, um, then I think that gives you a boost in your chances um, getting into the, the top U.S. schools. Um, yeah, I, I think Caroline is going to say, I think the biggest challenge for international applicants for U.S. schools is uh, really the issue of getting the visa to stay here. So if you're already in the mm -hmm. country, if you have the ability to come to the United States for an extended period of time already, probably not a big issue. If mm -hmm. you have to start with the application of getting a student visa, uh, that could be challenging given the current environment. Uh, yes. On the other hand, um, schools may be willing, uh, if there is a problem with getting the visa to, as you say, starting online or perhaps even granting deferrals for students that have problems getting the visas. So you might get an offer of admission, um, if you can't get the visa, you might be able to start at, on a delayed basis, or you might even get be able to get a deferral. So yes. something else to consider if you're ready ready to actually apply. Yes. Yeah, I also think that there's the issue of, you know, perhaps you can start virtually, but then are you missing out on part of the experience, right? So mm -hmm. um, I remember fondly my orientation at Columbia Business School, and that was mm -hmm. a really important part of the student experience. So if you're an international student and you have to start online, I mean, of course, you can, once you get to campus, you can build some great relationships, but um, perhaps you're better served if you were planning on applying next year in round one anyway, and maybe you're going to have a, a better experience if you, if you wait a little bit and aren't, don't subject yourself to those risks that we don't really understand just yet. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, lots, lots of trade-offs here, and, and unfortunately, we don't, uh, don't have a perfectly clear crystal ball. Yeah. As the schools don't know either yet right, how things are going right. to evolve. I mean, I think also, you know, thinking about one year versus two year programs, um, in some in some ways, you know, perhaps the two year program is a better option right now. And I, I, uh, it's a challenging thing for me to say coming from INSEAD. Um, but at least, you know, if you're going into a two year program um, and you are going to have a spell that's going to be online. At least that may be a smaller proportion of your MBA experience overall. Whereas if you're going into a one-year program, um, and you know a chunk of it's going to be online because of the the coronavirus crisis, then um, you know that could have a bigger impact on your, um, your your whole experience. So, you know, two years is is a good length of time, and you know if you have to spend a couple of months um, out of the country or connecting in a different way with your class, at the end of the day, you're still going to get a tremendous experience and um, you know, fantastic credential and a great springboard for your career. So um, it may be worth uh, you know, taking that risk at this time. All right, so our next question is, if I take the GMAT or the GRE online, will it carry less weight than an in-person exam? Karen, what are your thoughts about that? So I don't believe so. I mean, I think schools understand that uh, you might not have the choice right now. Um, I think they would also appreciate your being proactive, right? Um, so for example, Wharton is letting you submit your GMAT score um, much later, but I'm sure they would appreciate, let's say you were studying and you were supposed to take the exam around now. Anyway, I'm sure they would appreciate seeing that you put in the effort, you got the score on file, mm -hmm. and you're, you're moving forward. You're not letting the situation paralyze you, right? Um, so I, I don't think that the online exam will necessarily carry less weight than in person. Mm -hmm. I also think there are some advantages. I mean, I know sometimes my clients will take practice tests at home and score really well, and then mm -hmm. they'll get to the actual exam and, and you know, they have test anxiety and, and mm -hmm. they were so much more comfortable taking the practice test on their couch at home. Um, or, you know, the person next to them is making a lot of noise and it's very distracting. Um, I had somebody in New York City have like drilling in the building next door and it was very distracting. Um, so all sorts of things can happen when you're not at home. So I actually think um, you're in a much more controlled environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a nice opportunity to try these exams at home. Um, and maybe we can even set a precedent for future years who knows if it goes really well <laughs> um, yeah. maybe this is something that will become more common yes yes it may <clears throat> and i i know that some candidates have expressed concerns about you know will the schools have confidence in the test because it does seem that you know there could be more potential for cheating in an on in a home environment versus in a test center so you know i know that the the, the test prep, um, or sorry, the, the test administrators are um, putting in place lots of um, rules. You know, you have to have the webcam set up. They have to be able to see the whole room. You, um, 
you have you can't have any food or drink you know they're sort of watching you the whole time and they're registering um where your eyes are moving in the room to see if you know you're looking away from the screen are you looking at other materials or not so you know they're working very hard to make sure that the environment is as controlled as possible i think it's also possible that schools will be um cross-checking you know whether your your home gmat or home gre test result correlates with um your previous academic experience so you know if you have a strong gpa and a strong home gmat um then they're going to have more confidence than in a candidate who has you know otherwise a very weak academic record and then suddenly does brilliantly on a on, on a home um, gmat or gre um so you know they'll be They'll be doing some due diligence, I think, on um, candidates' academics um, when they're evaluating these tests. Yeah, I, I, I would so agree, Carolyn. I'm sorry, Karen, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I spoke with somebody two days ago who's a deferred enrollment applicant, um, mm -hmm. and she hasn't yet taken the exam, and she asked me this exact question, and she has a little line on her resume that says that she had an SAT score of 2380. So mm -hmm. she may as well keep that on her resume just to yeah. kind of validate, right? Because right. I think she's going to knock yeah. the GMAT out yep. of the park. Right. Um, may as well just prove, you know, this is something that I do consistently. I'm very good at these standardized tests, right? So right. just yes. kind of keep the proof there. And you're right, your GPA also matters. Sorry, go ahead, Villain. Yeah. No, I was going to just to reiterate, the, the admissions committee is going to take a look at the entire package. And if the GMAT score is just doesn't quite fit with everything else in the package, for some reason, it's vastly higher or vastly lower, then they'll start to ask some questions and dig a little bit deeper. But if it's kind of consistent and um, supportive of everything else that's in the package, um, I, I think they'll be perfectly fine with the online version. Yeah. And I understand that GMAT will be launching the at-home test around the middle of April, so just a, another couple of weeks. So um, if you are waiting to be able to take the test, then um, it might not be too much longer. Um, so our next question is, how will schools make decisions without seeing a GMAT score? <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts on that, Bill? Well, I mean, just they'll look at everything else in the package, right? Uh, so there will be probably greater weight placed on uh, transcripts and undergraduate or other mm. graduate degree programs uh, to kind of get a sense of the academic ability of the student. Uh, if the schools, and, and some schools are going to begin to make some preliminary decisions prior to getting a, a score, and other schools have actually said we'll make full decisions without scores. And so they'll be looking at, at the work experience, they'll be looking at undergraduate transcripts, GPA, the kind of work that has been done. Um, and, and they're perfectly capable of making a decision on that basis. Mm -hmm. and, but that provides a, a, poses a challenge actually for candidates whose undergraduate record may not have been as strong as they would have liked it to have been, mm -hmm. uh, and who are hoping to kind of counterbalance that with a very, very strong mm -hmm. GMAT score. Uh, you won't have that option um, in these cases. But uh, from the standpoint of the schools, it's, you know, instead of 10 pieces of information to look at, they'll have nine. And so the decision process will still be very much the same as it had been, but the, they'll have one less data point to kind of assess academic ability. Hmm. Yeah, some people will be very happy about that. It may force right. schools to be a bit less reliant on the, that, that's true. On I mean, the standardized some, test. For some people, this could be a very big positive and others it might be a bit of a negative because they were counting on its, uh, the GMAT score to kind of counterbalance some other aspects of the application. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think in many cases, um, you know, the schools will not necessarily be admitting candidates without the standardized test, but they may be providing, um, you know, putting candidates through the process, putting them to the interview stage and so on before they've been able to take the GMAT. Um, and they may be deferring, making a decision on their case until the candidates had a chance to take that test. Right. Um, so so you're, you're right. So again, depends on the school. And some schools have indicated they're going to eliminate the standardized tests for this round and others have said we'll begin the process and allow you to submit and we'll take a look at the scores when they come in and in those cases again it may be to your advantage just because you'll get a little bit farther into the process mm. you may even get to the interview stage and if you're a strong interviewer that uh, that could be a big positive if your GMAT scores ultimately aren't what you had hoped them to be yeah yeah absolutely all right, um, so our next question is, will this round be more or less competitive than usual? 
So, you know, I think it's going to be, as we've said, you know, there's going to be less, it will be less competitive. There'll be more places available because, um, you know, the school started this season um, in normal circumstances and, you know, had a round one and round two where they um, had anticipated a certain level of yield. Everything has changed now. Um, so their yield, uh, which is, uh, you know, the number of or the percentage of admits who accept the offer and then finally turn up on campus. Um, and that's a very important metric for the admissions office as they, they're crafting the class to make sure that they have, you know, the right number of people um, in the classroom and, the, and the, the sort of diversity and mix of students that they're looking for. Um, so managing yield has become a complete nightmare for the admissions offices. Um, people are dropping out from round one and round two that, um, that wouldn't have otherwise dropped out. So they certainly have more room in these final rounds. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you know, there'll be a lot more people applying um, because, uh, you know, they're pushing back the deadlines. People are, are throwing their head into the ring who might not otherwise have applied um, for this season. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's also driven by candidates who, um, you know, unfortunately may be losing their jobs or may not be getting promised promotions or opportunities that they would otherwise have had because of the economic downturn. So it's, uh, um, you know, there'll be more places um, available, um, but the level of competition will depend on how many people apply. So that's, it, it's a difficult thing to judge, but certainly, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, there, there is more opportunity available and you know it could be a good time to apply as well because um the round one that is yet to come could be even more competitive than it was 12 months ago so um yeah i'd go, go also ahead. like to point out caroline that i mean certainly amongst the top schools around the world they are so competitive so competitive in a normal year that even if they are less competitive now, it's still very competitive. Um, yes. So it's not as though all of a sudden a 580 GMAT score is going to get you into one of the yeah. M7 schools. Um, so all of this is relative. And as you say, there may be more people throwing their hat in the ring for this round than in the mm -hmm. past. So the actual level of competition, I think, is still very much up in the air. Right. Yeah, I liked what Judith said on our last webinar. She said, you know, they're not exactly opening up the floodgates, right? Um, right. So the, the, yeah. the standards are not changing. I think the other thing that's really important to consider, so I've had a lot of emails in the past week of, of, of candidates asking, you know, I was planning to apply in round one next year. Should I move it up? And so to me, this question is less about the competitiveness of this round and more about will you be more competitive if you wait until round mm -hmm. one or, and are you right. less competitive now? So have you not even taken the GMAT yet? And is that kind of a total wild card? Are you going to have to rush and study and maybe mm -hmm. not get as high of a score that you would have otherwise had if you gave yourself time? Um, have you already started thinking about essays or are you going to be throwing together essays really quickly over the, the next few weeks, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important important to think about the quality of your candidacy and if that's going to greatly uh, suffer then mm. I think waiting makes Wait. more sense because you're going to put your best foot forward. Absolutely yeah so it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got a question on scholarships. Um, will scholarships be available for round three applicants? Karen your thoughts on availability of financing right now? So I'm really curious to hear from you two as well on, on your thoughts, given that you both were kind of in that room before. Um, mm. I would assume, I mean, right now they have promised quite a bit of money this year, right? Um, so versus if you apply round one of next year, they wouldn't have promised any money essentially. Um, but then also we might have candidates who are admitted that can't make it to campus and therefore their funding will be a bit up in the mm. air. So maybe they're kind of opening up some, some funding now. Um, mm. I also think if they see some really strong profiles of people that they really would like to have right. in the class, they might want to incentivize you to kind of hurry up and come to campus now. Um, so they'll, they'll mm. want to push that decision, right? Um, mm. So I guess I'm kind of wavering on there will be funding, maybe not as much as in round one next year, but I'm curious mm. to hear what you think. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, you know, typically the, um, you know, the, the funding um, can vary by round. So, uh, you know, often there is more financing available in the earlier rounds than the later rounds. But as you said, you know, scholarship recipients from earlier rounds may be dropping out. And so um, there may well be more scholarship financing available 
in, in round three or round four in the final rounds now than they would otherwise have been available. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a bit of an unknown quantity and, you know, you should have a plan for how you're going to finance your MBA um, in the absence of a scholarship. Uh, so yeah, you know, don't I, I don't think anybody can expect to get a scholarship, but, but I, my own feeling is that schools will be We'll open up the purse strings a little bit this year just to make sure they meet their numbers for the entering class. And there yes. may be some more money flowing than would otherwise uh, just to ensure that you get a full class. Yes. Yeah, they may be using the scholarship financing to, to secure um, the numbers, as you say. Um, all right. So our next question, um, what are the implications of all of this for the fall 2020 admission cycle? Bill, what are your thoughts on well, that? Well, as we said last week in the, in the session, I think the general consensus is that uh, application numbers for next year are likely to go up hmm. uh, as people lose their jobs, as people um, decide now is a good time to go back to school, uh, as some of the folks that perhaps decided not to start this year defer till next year or reapply for next year. I hmm. think the application pool next year is likely to be larger than than it has been in the past. Yeah. And that's often the case in, in any kind of a, an economic downturn, you often see applications to full-time MBA programs go up. So that's my expectation, I think. It is. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I, I think we're seeing that already an increased interest for, for round one applications. Um, and you know, for many candidates, it can make sense to, to go to business school in a downturn. You know, especially if you're looking at a, um, you know, a two year program where you can perhaps hope to be graduating right. into a job market that's somewhat different to current circumstances. So um, uh, just be aware that the level of competition could, could be very stiff. All right. Um, so um, next question is, should I apply round three or wait until round one, um, the next cycle, which is more advantageous? So um, so as we said, you know, the, the competition for round one is likely to be greater um, than it was for round one um, in the fall of 2019. Um, round three competition, you know, there will be more places available, but there are also more people applying. So that's difficult to judge. Um, in terms of which is more advantageous, then I think it comes back to what Karen was saying about you know, whether this is the right time for you. Are you, um, you know, at your most competitive now or would waiting a few more months and applying in round one um, give you more time to prepare, um, give you time to, you know, get those tests under the belt, um, just have a more well-rounded application. Um, because as we've said, you know, schools will still have very high standards. You know, they may have more places in round three, but they, they will still be looking for candidates to be very well prepared. And um, file readers are very uh, well versed and, and um, able to, to figure out, you know, if you have um, thrown together an application at the last minute, is it, has it been rushed or is it an application that has been well thought out and, and, um, and, and well considered over, over some time? Um, and they're, they're very good at reading between the lines and understanding whether, um, you know, this is something that you have thought very carefully about. It's part of your long term plans or whether this is something that has really just, you know, come up in the last few weeks because of the crisis and, and you have decided to, to jump at this opportunity. So I think it's, um, you know, the, the answer is it depends and it depends on, you know, your your level of preparation and your readiness to to um to to apply now any other thoughts on that well I, I think another thing to think about in in is what is the next three or four months likely to look like for you as an applicant how are you dealing with the crisis yourself what kinds of things are you continuing to work are you not are you um, I, i've seen some uh, former colleagues who are kind of coming up with innovative ways of trying to source uh, personal protective equipment and bring it back into the United States. Are you engaged in something that is actually yeah. helping and dealing with this crisis? If so, if there's something you can show over the course of the summer, that may be a very powerful statement for entry and, and for your application in the fall. Uh, you know, not everybody's going to have that opportunity. But again, thinking about what the next three or four months is going to look like for you from a career standpoint, from a 
um, you know, self-development standpoint, and will that make you a stronger, stronger applicant in the fall uh, or not? So that's one other thing to think about as you decide between round three and round one next year. Yes. As, well, as well as school selection, I mean, I think your options are going to be a little bit more limited now. Not every school has extended their deadlines. Um, so, you know, if HBS is your first choice, then I would say don't rush and apply now and end up, I mean, you might end up at a top school, but it might, might, you'll never know if your top choice would have panned out, right? So you're kind of just subject to this situation versus getting to really own the process for yourself next year. Um, my clients can attest because I've been getting a lot of emails about, you know, should we rush and put in an application now? And most of the time I say no, given the situation. I mean, it's very rare that there's somebody who it seems like, you know, um, the timing could, could work for us. This makes sense. Um, you have kind of all of the pieces that in motion that need to be in motion. Right. Um, you know, as for this, all these considerations about kind of international and domestic and all these things. So the stars really need to align for it to be advantageous. advantageous. Um, mm. Otherwise, I'm going a little conservative on the answer to this one. Okay. All right. So um, our final question, um, and, and we'll also um, be going through some questions that um, our audience, uh, you can enter any time into, into the chat function in the webinar. Um, on the right hand side so please do feel free to um to type in your questions there and we have some time for q a uh, this is a question we received earlier how can i put forth the best possible round three application despite limited time between now and the deadlines um so karen back to you on that one yeah so we've talked obviously a lot about timing i think that it's also important to I mean, you don't have to make all of your essays all about why now is the right time, but you mm. can plant some phrasing in there to prove that, you know, this timing makes sense for you versus uh, next year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so think about that kind of why do you need the MBA now and maybe preemptively address that in your essays. Um, I think also you can work closely with your recommenders to ensure that they uh, are aligned with that story of why now is really the right time for you. Um, and then as Bill starts to talk about, I think it's also really nice, you know, um, to demonstrate how are you making an impact given the current crisis and, and how are you using your time? Um, mm. I'm not one of these people, but I see on, all over the internet, all these people that have all this time to sit around and watch Netflix. Well, are you watching Netflix or are you starting a social initiative at your firm and doing um, virtual coffee chats and bringing your community together? Or are you doing some sort of community service work on Zoom, right? Um, so tell that story, show how you're not just watching Netflix uh, and really <laughs> using this time. Um, I think it's also about, you know, um, schools always really value how you engage with them and, and with their students and alumni. And obviously that's much harder now, um, but I think they would appreciate being proactive and, and still trying to work that process, even if it's virtual, right? Um, so you can't just say, you know, I, for example, Columbia asks in the application, which students and alumni and admissions committee members have you spoken with? If you have zero, zero, zero for all of those, um, A, it might look like now is not the right time and you're not prepared, um, but B, you know, why not? You still can connect, right? Um, and obviously your story, your story becomes even more important, especially if, um, if you're submitting without exam scores and your essays are just so critical. So um, I think putting forth the best possible round three application really includes a very polished essay to, um, again, address all of these, these moving parts and make sure your story is really uh, a tight story. Mm. Great. All right. Um, so those are the questions that we received um, ahead of time. Um, so I wanted to have a look now at some of the questions that are coming in live. And um, also while we're having a look at those questions, I wanted to mention that um, if you haven't yet spoken with Fortuna, um, please do sign up for a free consultation. Um, you can sign up for a 30 minute um, strategy session um, on our website and we'd be very happy to talk to you about your MBA plans and, and give you some advice. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at applying in, in these final rounds, um, we do have coaches available who could review and, and help you finalize with those applications. All right. Um, so, um, so there's a question about um, the online GMAT score. So I guess this is um, for, the, for the GMAT that, or GRE that people will be taking at home and also be valid for round one of the next year's class. Um, that's an interesting question. I think probably yes, but 
as it hasn't yet been launched, um, there aren't, we don't yet have clear policies on that. So I've seen the, um, the at-home GMAT, um, uh, the, the terminology is an interim GMAT. Um, so I don't know whether that will then um, be regarded as um, valid once the test centers have reopened um, for, for uh, future classes. Um, so, you know, I, I think for, for these final rounds and probably for round one, um, the schools will accept that those at home scores um, because they understand that, you know, that was the option that was available to candidates at the time. Um, but whether those scores will have the same length of validity as, um, as the normal test score, um, I think is, you know, yet to be defined. Um, but, you know, if that's your best option right now, I would just go, I would go for it because it's, um, you know, if schools, uh, it, it, schools would like to see you taking that rather than just waiting for the test centers to reopen. So, um, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to take the at home test, um, do take that opportunity um, rather than uh, just wait for the test centers to reopen and tell the schools, you know, I'll, I'll take it in a few months, but you, you don't necessarily know yet um, when that would be. So um, you should show willing and, and take the at-home test if you can. Um, all right. Okay. Probably on you, that point, I've also yeah. seen schools, um, probably not this year, I haven't seen it, but it, you know, over the past few years on occasion, I've seen schools say, we'd like to admit you, you know, they'll send a letter to an applicant and say, you're admitted based on if you can increase your GMAT past X score. Uh, very, very rare for this to happen. And I hear about it maybe once a year. Um, yeah. And again, not this year at all. But maybe this is an instance in which they would do that and say, okay, you're at a 690. If you can just get a 720 by the time you arrive to campus, um, you're good, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so there might be a little bit more flexibility. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And some schools have said that they will be giving conditional acceptances um, in, in these circumstances. Right. Um, another question. If you've been waitlisted in multiple schools from round two, I'm a Canadian candidate applying to U.S. schools. Do we expect a lot of waitlist movement? Yeah. So I think um, candidates who are waitlisted from round one and round two are more likely to receive offers than they would otherwise have been. Um, the concern that the schools will have is whether an international candidate will be able to get to campus. Um, but if you are waitlisted right now, um, you know, I think it's a good time to be proactive in, um, you know, communicating to the schools that you remain interested and committed. Uh, so, you know, obviously you don't want to be pestering them every day, but um, sending a thoughtful communication um, you know, perhaps every three or four weeks to, to touch base with your admissions officer, um, reiterate your motivation and commitment, um, that, that now would be a good time to do that because, um, you know, schools don't always know if a waitlisted candidate is still committed, right? They, that, they know that those candidates may be looking at other options and maybe losing interest in, in the school where they're waitlisted. So if you are genuinely motivated and if you would accept that offer um, it's a good idea to to keep on the radar screen of the admissions office and, and stay in touch with them proactively that may help your chances of getting a confirmed offer um, all right uh, next question so if my GMAT is not necessarily where I would like it to be, but all other aspects of my application um, are ready, do you recommend that I apply for this round four or wait for round one until I can get the GMAT to be more competitive? I don't believe anything will change for me professionally between now round four and round one. Right. Um, I guess the question there is how, how likely is it, uh, does the candidate think that the GMAT score will improve significantly and by significantly 30 points or more? Um, if that's likely, uh, that would certainly strengthen an application. If it's not, um, why not go ahead with a, an application that's already put together and, and make it go? Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, another question. Considering the current circumstances, would European business schools be willing to relax their admissions criteria? Um, so as we've said, you know, I, I don't think schools are going to be 
changing their admissions criteria. I think it may be that the competition that can otherwise be a bit stiffer in the final rounds might not be quite as tough as it was 12 months ago. Um, but the admissions criteria will stand. So um, you should aim to be as competitive as you would otherwise have been, you know, if you'd been applying before all of this had happened. Um, yeah, I right. think that, uh, Caroline, I think that's a key point. I, I don't see schools relaxing any criteria whatsoever. Um, clearly, they're taking, uh, they're looking at the scores and uh, standardized tests in a slightly different way, but they're not looking for candidates that are less qualified than they have been in the past. Uh, mm. They're still looking for the same kinds of things. So you need to have a very strong application if you're going to be admitted to one of these top schools. Uh, as as I, I think we all said earlier, it's not as though somebody who was never going to get into a top school has now all of a sudden got a great chance to do so. You still have to have a very strong application. You have to have all the pieces together and, and you have to be able to meet the competition, which is still very strong. Yes. And again, there may be more places open. So you know, at the margin, there may be some differences, but it, it's not a, it's just a little bit at the margin. It's not a wholesale change in what the schools are looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so next question is, um, if a candidate has been rejected in earlier rounds, would reapplying now make sense? So, um, so normally, you know, if you've been rejected in round one, round two, schools don't um, accept applications for the same class from the same candidate. So you would need to wait for the next class. Um, and, you know, whether that would make sense, it depends. Um, so, you know, I would say if, if you've been able to improve your candidacy, if your application looks stronger, then reapplying could certainly make sense. Um, but, you know, if you reapply with the same profile, then likely you will get the same response. Um, so, uh, you know, you need to think about how you, um, how your profile can evolve since you, since you were um, previously rejected and, and think about, you know, give some careful thought to, you know, why you were rejected and can you address those concerns that the school may have had. Um, Next question, when do, you th when do you think the surge of applications to MBAs will start? I've been planning to apply um, to next January 2020 intake, so that could be an INSEAD application um, for a while now, and worried this new surge will be to my detriment applying for this spring's deadline. So, I mean, there's, it's already started. Um, so there's an increase in application volume. So, you know, just apply. I would go ahead with your plans if that's what you were going to do anyway. Um, the volume of application is, is, you know, as we've said, there's going to be an increase in round one. There's, it, the, the next class will have a higher volume of applications as well. So it doesn't necessarily um, play in your favor to wait either. So, you know, if, if you were prepared and ready to apply um, for a deadline now, um, then I would go ahead in any case. Um, and, you know, be aware that the schools are also, you know, anticipating issues with yields and will therefore, um, you know, likely be waitlisting more candidates as well. So, um, you know, if you are on the borderline or if they have, you know, great increase in volume, then there's probably a higher chance of being waitlisted now than there might otherwise have been. And being waitlisted is not ideal, right? It's um, a difficult situation to be in, but the good news of being waitlisted is the door is, is still open. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it, people do often, you know, many people get off the wait list. So if that happens to you, I wouldn't despair. I, I, I don't think, think there's, that, oh, go ahead, Karen, sorry. For January entry, um, I also think that comes back to what we were talking about before, as far as, you know, if that was your plan all along, make that very clear in your essays that that's what um, you've been thinking about, that you really thought through it and that that makes sense for you. I'm not sure if we're talking about INSEAD or, for example, Columbia's J term. Um, if it's Columbia, I do think that they might see um, extra applications in J term, which is known for getting fewer applications. And so mm -hmm. people might see that as sort of a, a, a backdoor in a sense, because they're thinking that September will be extremely competitive um, to enter the following September. Um, so make it very clear why, if it's J term for Columbia, why is J term the right program for you, right? Why don't you need the internship? Um, why is now the right time for you to start business school? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say just 
I think there's a danger in trying to game the system and trying to ascertain when the best time to apply is. The best time to apply is when you are ready to go back to school and when you have a good solid application to submit. Um, uh, and so trying to figure out is it January, is it next June, is it next September? Uh, as I think you've heard throughout today, there's no clear answer. We have lots mm -hmm. of it depends here. So when are you mm -hmm. going to be ready to go back to school? Submit a great application and see what happens. Uh, that mm -hmm. would be my advice at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a question on um, recommendation letters. Um, will schools provide some flexibility in regards to when they need the letters of recommendation? Um, will they start the review process without seeing these recommendations? Um, so I believe that MIT has said that they will, they will um, begin processing applications with one letter of recommendation initially. Um, and, you know, I imagine that schools are being flexible right now because they understand that, um, you know, circumstances are very different and people's availability to write recommendation letters um, to a specific deadline may have changed. So, uh, but, you know, unless a school has specifically said that they will have a change of policy on this, you know, you can't assume that that is the case. So, there's a risk that um, you know, they may regard your application as incomplete if those recommendation letters aren't in by the deadline. Um, if, you, if you do have any sort of issue with your application, you know, if there are missing materials like the recommendation letters or you, know, you, um, you have a concern about your, your GMAT and maybe you've taken it before and you were going to retake and you're not able to retake, you know, I would say be proactive in explaining those circumstances to the school. Don't assume that they will just understand, you know, what has happened. Um, you know, most schools have an optional essay where you can explain extenuating circumstances. And so, you know, do um, give that context if you do have any issues with getting your application together. Um, but if you have a lot of those issues, you know, as we've said, it may just be better to wait uh, until um, a later date rather than rushing things in now. But yeah. just make sure that you're aligned with whatever the school's policy is that they've posted. So, for example, Wharton, um, now they extended the deadline altogether, but originally they didn't extend the application deadline. They just extended the recommender deadline by a week, acknowledging that it's difficult for recommenders, right? Now they have just extended the application deadline overall. Um, but the point is, if there are schools that have um, just that extended recommender deadline, I don't think they'll be very forgiving past that date, right? So make sure you stay on top of it. So some of them have given you wiggle room, but I don't think you should take more wiggle room than what they've given you. Right. So just um, be really on top of what the policies are. Some of them are outlined on our blog, um, again, also on the school's website. So it's important that you're tracking that and, and pushing your recommenders and working with them to help them uh, make everything happen on time. And like Caroline said, if there's some sort of issue, um, connect with the school. Don't just roll the dice and, and see what happens and maybe they'll let it in, right? Mm. Yeah, the, more, the more pieces that are not uh, available on the submission date, the the more obvious it is that this was a last minute decision on your part. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so a, a question, an interesting question on um, the, the attitude of schools right now. Um, so participant is asking how much compassion can we expect from schools at this time? I appreciate the extension of deadlines and so on, but also recognize the reality um, of applicants and all their loved ones will be victims of COVID-19 in many ways. How do you expect schools to treat this? So, you know, I think the admissions officers are trying to um, be compassionate and, um, you know, they're being flexible and, you know, part of that flexibility is what you've seen and the, the points that we've discussed about the, the extension of deadlines and, and, you know, being flexible on test scores and, and recommendation letters and so on. So, they are trying to um, accommodate the difficult circumstances. Um, and, you know, they, they totally appreciate that this is, you know, un uncharted territory for, for candidates and, you know, it certainly is for them. They're, business schools are also struggling with this. Um, it's very challenging times for everybody. So, um, you know, I think they will be as understanding as they can, um, but it's important, as we said, you know, if you do have um, challenges or, you know, particularly difficult situation, do explain that to the schools. Um, sometimes people worry that, you know, they shouldn't explain 
personal circumstances that may seem like too much information. Um, and it's a difficult judgment call to make, but if it's relevant and if it's material to your application and to your, um, the presentation of your candidacy, then I would err on the, on the side of being open with the business schools and explaining to them um, if, if you, know, you are in difficult circumstances and um, you know, how that's affecting you. They, they are absolutely human and um, you know, they, they, uh, they want to uh, treat candidates appropriately and you know, be, be, um, re respond in the correct way to your, to your circumstances. At the same time, you know, as we've said, they still have strict criteria that they need to adhere to. So it's, you know, it's a difficult balancing act for the schools as well. But I would say, you know, be, be as ready as you can when you submit your application and also be open about how current circumstances are impacting you. Um, do you have a question about, um, you know, if a candidate applies now in a final round and gets rejected, what are the implications on a reapplication in round one? Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so there's nothing stopping you from, um, you know, applying now. And if it doesn't work out, apply again in round one. Uh, you know, schools are very open to reapplications. That's absolutely fine. But I would say that you need to think about how your application would have evolved between those two points in time, because it may be that the answer is not much if there are only, you know, there's only a few um, short period of time, a few months between those two applications. <clears throat> And if you apply with, you know, pretty much the same candidacy, most likely you'll get the same response. Any thoughts on that, Bill or I, Karen? I would agree entirely. I mean, what's going to be different about your application the next time you apply, whether that's from round three to round one or round three this year to uh, round one, two years hence. So the schools will be looking and they will have copies of the prior application and they'll look very closely. What, what has changed? What makes you a stronger candidate now than you were before. Is it a better GMAT score? Is it additional courses, additional responsibility, uh, new activities in the community? Mm. Um, what makes you different? And if you only have a couple, three months, it's not a, you don't have a lot of time to make things very different. Uh, so I would think that a reapplication in round one after round three is very unlikely to get a different answer uh, if you were rejected in round three. I agree. And then I also think that that um, what I've been telling clients sometimes as well, you know, if you really want to give it a go for round three, try it, but maybe you narrow down your school list a little bit so that you're putting yourself at less risk if you're going to be reapplying next year. So maybe it's just those two or three really dream schools now, if it works out for you, great. But then, you know, if you had a list of six or seven schools that you're interested in, well, the other three or four won't have seen a, a previous application. And then mm. um, you can really put your best foot forward and having kind of ruin your chances at all of them. Um, so I agree that it's going to be hard. I actually think that's one of the hardest parts of, of this whole round three uh, mm -hmm. situation that it's going to be very hard to prove how you've changed when you're, it'll just mm -hmm. be September anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, a question for you, Karen, on Columbia. Um, so with schools like Columbia that review applications on a rolling basis, how early before the extended deadline of June the 1st do you recommend that we apply? <laughs> um, I think it was Bill who said before, uh, you need to apply when you're ready, right? So um, for example, let's say you take the at-home GMAT on April 15th or whenever it's launched and you don't believe that that's your best score, then don't rush and get the application in, right? Um, so I think, and, and by the way, that also, depends on all these other factors, right? If you were relying on the GMAT to be the highlight of your application, then maybe you should wait until you have the GMAT score on file because they are letting you submit um, without the score. So there is a lot of moving parts, um, but I think that what's most important is that your application, and I would say this in any round, not just now, your application needs to be polished and thoughtful and not rushed. I think it's very obvious when an application is rushed. Obviously time, uh, the, the timing of your application is uh, more important for Columbia than other schools because it is on a rolling basis. Uh, but I still think that it's better to apply later with a mm. better application. Yeah, okay. Um, so we have a question about um, the potential impact of deferrals. And I think, you know, that's an interesting point. So the question is, 
Being accepted into an MBA starting in September um, next year will be more difficult since everyone is postponing enrollment this year. Um, I think there will be more demand for next year. So yes, it's a good point that um, entry for um, schools starting in September 2021 may be impacted by a number of candidates who will have deferred um, their entry who are admitted for this fall and um, get deferrals for the following year. Um, and, you know, to what extent that will ex impact class numbers is not yet clear because I don't think schools have communicated a clear deferral policy. So typically with deferrals, you know, schools are, are quite strict on those requests because, you know, it makes managing the class numbers very difficult if, you, if you're generous in granting deferrals. So, you know, when I was admissions director at INSEAD, we would grant deferrals um, for very specific circumstances only. Um, and that would be, for example, um, you know, a medical issue for the candidate or a close family member. Um, perhaps they had, you know, a once in a lifetime um, job opportunity, um, or you know, they were having difficulty putting together their financing for the for the MBA, and having a few more months or another year would make a material difference to that. Um, but most of our requests were were refused. And um, so right now, schools will, you know, perhaps be a little bit more flexible on those deferral requests, especially for international candidates who, you know, won't be, may not be able to get, actually physically get to campus for the fall. Um, but to what extent they're going to allow those deferrals is not yet clear. Um, I doubt, um, I very much doubt they're going to grant deferrals to everyone who asks for it, um, because that would mean a huge shift of students from this fall um, to the following fall. But, you know, there are likely to be, um, you know, a lot more students who are um, starting in 2021 rather than 2020 and who were admitted um, for 2020 and have, will have deferred. So that is also something to take into account for, um, you know, round one and beyond that there may be fewer places available because of those deferrals. Any thoughts, Bill, on how you think schools well, are handling I, I, I think uh, just, just to reiterate what you said, I, I think um, you know, we don't know for sure, but I think it would, mm -hmm. it's unlikely that schools will grant blanket deferrals. I think it'll still be case-by-case -case basis and, and not a simple thing to do. More likely for international students who can't get visas or uh, for those folks who are directly affected medically uh, by the, the situation, they, they may get a deferral. I don't think it's going to be dramatically higher numbers than in the past. Uh, that's my gut feeling at this point. I just think schools are, you know, they have their own uh, revenue and admissions targets they have to adhere to. And it really throws off the school's whole financial situation if they end up granting all sorts of deferrals. Because you can never be certain that those deferrals are coming back the following year. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, someone who's deferred is less likely to finally join the program than someone who just, you know, accepts the offer and comes to the class they were supposed to come to. Um, so uh, we have a question about European schools. Uh, most of the European schools, such as LDS, Cambridge and Oxford, have not extended their deadlines. Does that mean they are not concerned with applicants arriving on campus? Does it still make sense to apply in their round four right now? Well, most of the international schools have later deadlines anyway. Um, and um, so I think, you know, they don't see the need as much as the US schools to extend those deadlines right now. Um, I am sure, you know, they will be facing the same issues right now that the US schools are facing. So I'm sure that they have more places to allocate in these final rounds than they would otherwise have had. Um, so, you know, I would encourage you to apply to those final rounds if you're prepared and if now would be the right time for you to apply in any case. Um, but, you know, everything that we've said as regards the US schools, you know, also applies to all of the, the top international schools as well. All right, um, so I think we are out of time. Um, thank you so much um, to everyone who's joined us today. And, um, and to our panelists, um, Bill and Karen, you know, really appreciate your, your thoughts um, on, in these uh, unprecedented circumstances. You know, we don't have all of the answers, but um, you know, trying to give you, um, our, um, you know, our best advice on how to nav navigate these uh, unprecedented <laughs> circumstances. 
And, you know, as we said, um, feel free to get in touch with us. I know that we haven't been able to answer all of your questions today. So uh, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, and also, you know, if you haven't yet spoken to Fortuna, um, please do sign up for a free consultation. And we'd be very happy to talk to you about your specific circumstances and any questions you have about your candidacy. So thank you very much. And um, we look forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you, everybody.